Good evening. Welcome to Urban Facts. I'm your host, Eamon Hotep Parker. And it is a pleasure to be with you guys once again. Um, today, unfortunately, we lost a legend in the dancing community, <clears throat> Miss Ladiva Davis. Miss Davis was the what the get up there was the director of Kappa's high school dance department. She was also um a television host. <coughs> Excuse me. Um she's won consecutive awards. She's won our award, the Hoduma Boar Award for Excellent Community Service. She's also won awards in music uh, with her work with Stevie Wonder and countless, countless other achievements. She will surely be missed and forever loved in the black community. So, um, today we'll be interviewing Miss Tanea Stevens. She is the niece of Mr. James Lambert, uh, one of the community members that lost his life to uh, some youth on uh, June 24th of this year. Um, so we use the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. But a lot of us may not know where that phrase comes from. So let me help you out. So the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, originates from an African proverb, <coughs> excuse me, and conveys the message that it takes many people in the village to provide safe, healthy environment for children, where children are given the security they need to develop and flourish, mm -hmm. to be able to realize their hopes and dreams, the rec this requirement this requires an environment where children's voices are taken seriously, and where multiple people, the villagers, including parents, siblings, extended family members, neighbors, teachers, professionals, community members, and policy makers, care for a child. All these children, excuse me, all these villagers may provide direct care to the children and or support the parent in looking after their children. However, the village in many countries today is dissipated, that's including America, and fragmented, and individuals are increasingly isolated and not eager to ask for or provide help to others. Families break down, economic pressures, long working hours, increasing mobility have all con contributed to families feeling less connected to the extended family members and the individuals around them. Um, when, when I was coming up, you, you could have a neighbor like correct your child. You could say, hey, you know, what you doing outside late or, you know, don't touch so-and-so or, you know, whatever the, the offense of the child may be. And, you know, the neighbor could beat that child. Now, that's a thing of the past because these parents now don't have the proper tools to be parents. On June 24th, one of the villagers in our community Mr. James Lambert was trying to provide safety for children who he thought was out, well, they were out at a late uh, time of night, you know what I mean, and provided help and assistance. But as you've learned 
from his story that turned awry. Um, Mr. Lambert was, uh, I would say, a dedicated individual in the community. You'll learn from his niece, his story, you know, what he provided to the community in regards of his work, um, his family patriots and patronage to his family and that he was just an all around good guy. Um, it's hard to, to get individuals that's willing, you know, today, like I said, to help out with your ch children and to have someone um, senselessly <laughs> remove a villager from this village is very much unspeakable. We're going to go in, in depth and find out who Mr. Lambert was. We're not going to talk too much on the event because we want to honor his life. So without further ado, I'll present to you and reintroduce to others, Ms. Tania Stevens. And I, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Let me see here. Thank, thank, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. How are you doing today? I'm well. I'm so well. I thank you for the introduction to uh, my uncle. Oh my God! It made me tear up, um, and it, it, it's it's it's. I thank you very much for that introduction, for my thank you. No problem, no problem. That's what we definitely here for. We want to, you know, uplift the community. Uh, we definitely got your back, um, and we want the people to know because of right, you know, just as right now. <coughs> excuse me. Um. The community just knows of your uncle as the old man that was killed by two individuals that was in a crowd of children. Right. But he's more than just the old man that was, you know, killed by some individuals. So we're gonna talk a little bit about you, his life, and you know, any encouraging words you all have out here to oh. encourage parents in regards to the render, you know, the raising of their children. Awesome. So tell me about yourself and your upbringing as a child. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you for this opportunity, um, Mr. Parker. Like when, when I meet someone for the first time, as I am with your audience tonight, or I'm introducing myself to people, I say I come from a generation where dinosaurs roam the earth. Um, it's, it just seems like it was so long ago um, that it doesn't even seem real. Um, if if I, I it was I come from a very large family, mm -hmm. and um, you I heard uh, you prior to the introduction speak about the village, and um, if if had to describe my family, my upbringing, we were the epitome of the definition of a village. Mm -hmm. In our household as a child, where I grew up at, in the Spring Garden section of the city of Philadelphia, we had a four-story walk-up that was able to accommodate I think it was at the th three generations, four different families. One was my own with my mother, my father married with our family, and we had our own kitchen. It was just one house, and it was over like 30 people living in one house. We all slept with one another, we bathed with one another, we, we, Sport, played. Um, I um, 
I didn't know um, that I was black. <laughs> I didn't know that there were um, a difference between white, black, Hispanic. I didn't know that um, there were different cultures. I didn't know that there was just a difference in people because it was Hispanic families across the street from us where we lived in on Mount Vernon Street in the Spring Garden section. And um, we live. that go for millions of dollars now, um, but that's another story for another time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, Caucasian families on one side, and there was a nursing home, I believe, on the other side that was all these little old Caucasian folks. And my best friend was white, but I didn't know that she was white. I didn't know I was black. We were just people, and we enjoyed one another, and our family, we, we, um, my great grandmother and my great grandfather, it was actually their home and everyone else lived there. And, um, my mother, um, who some of your, um, viewers may remember, it's James Lane, my uncle's, uh, eldest sister. And my mother had to drop out of school to raise her siblings. And I believe it was 10 of them at the time. Mommy had to drop out of school as the eldest to raise her siblings because her parents, my grandparents, died tragically. Um, and um, at the time, my mother was um, pregnant with my sister. I was one my, um, and married to my dad. And, um, and then it, uh, it was... Um, a role that she had to take on, she had no choice because my great grandparents were the only living adults and my mom was 19 at the time and raising her siblings, my uncle James Lambert Jr. being one of them and uh, raising her own family and mm -hmm. husband. My, my father um, uh, was, was an abusive man. Um, physically abusive to my mom, but um, we we came through that. We made it through that with, with the help of my great grandparents, my aunts, my aunts, my cousins, and all of us that lived in that one big giant house that sort of, if it was still standing, it looked like a mansion. Mm -hmm. We, um, we just, I don't, I don't know. And then that was my younger years. And so when I moved to North Philadelphia, the heart of North Philadelphia, and we left a, 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 a interracial school at the time that was very, um, it was just, I, like I said, I didn't know there were different races at the time. So we left that the very close next generation a close-knit community, I'm sorry, where I grew up in because there was a candy store and a candy store was called Stella and the little old white lady and my aunts and uncles, they used to steal what they call penny candy and she never called the police. She knew who the family was and like at the end of the week, I'll never forget, I was with my mom because I was young, very young and we're still in Spring Garden. I don't want to get ahead of myself. And she gave my mom a note and she said, tell Carrie, my great grandma, the matriarch of the family, this is what she owes me. It was a list of maybe $20 of what my aunt and uncle had stolen, different little stuff. But that was the camaraderie. That was the, 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 the everyone knew everyone and it wasn't like let me call the police let me beat this kid let me shoot this kid that didn't exist that right didn't exist. so then we leave that area of the city and we relocate to um north the heart of north philadelphia uh went into a public school and i believe that was the first physical fight i had in school and because there were so many of us. There was 14 of us at the time. And mm -hmm. we got a reputation. I had 14 altogether, 13 siblings. And we had a reputation, don't mess with them. It's a lot of them. 
so we had to like grow up and take the channel real quick and, but it was still the togetherness and had friends and and people that would say they said oh my god i wish my family was like your family i wish they were close like you guys are, you know, it was always, we fought, you know, we had our problems, but man, I'll tell you, it, it was a different day and time. And I, right. If I could go back in time, I tell people the year I would go back to, I was a teenage mother. So, and I said the time I would go back to it, my son said, I guess I wouldn't have made it. I said, no, you wouldn't have. So, <laughs> yeah. And what I know now, and it would be a different thing, but we laugh about it because I have adult, a grown, I have two grown children, and my son was the problem of me being a teenage mother. But um, that came from not listening and thinking, you know, I guess how ninety percent of the children that think that the adults can't tell them anything. But my upbringing was phenomenal. Uh, well, yeah, it was phenomenal. I appreciate that. Um, so tell us a little bit about your uncle James, Mr. Lambert. Tell us, you know, inform us on what type of person he was. When when we relocated to the to the, mm -hmm. the North Philadelphia property, that that's where like from a, a an adolescent to uh, uh, about nineteen twenty years old, that's where I spent those years there. And my uncle gave me my first job. He um, he was so sharp. God, that man used to dress so sharp. But black men then wore dress suits all the time. They dressed up all the time. They called them silk and what they all they were always dressed up. Women were always dressed up when I was young. Women wore gloves, they carried purse, they were it was just a different time. And he told me, he said, he said, come here, baby girl. I said, yes, Uncle Simi. He said, um, Simi was the name we called him. That was his nickname. It was the family's term of endearment. His name was Simi. Mm -hmm. um, I said, yes. He said, um, I, I got a job for you. Said, yes, sir. He said, wash my tango every night. If you do a good job, I'll give you $10. I said, what? $10 to a 12 year old, you would say that I'd hit the lottery, it's a million dollars. I said, No problem, oh God, I'll take care of it. And that was my first job. I washed his Kango, and it was a foam wig head that my mom had it was in the trash. It was ate up, chewed up, whatever. And I would put the hat on it and let it dry by the old fan, and he paid me $10 a week. Mm -hmm. My first, first. First job that he gave me, he, when my dad, my dad I, was an abusive man, but he left us, um, I was, uh, I was uh, sixth grade, 12 years old, I think. And, um, and um, so my uncle stepped in because, you know, it was the next man in our family. So he said, right. and, you know, don't talk to that boy and, do this and don't disrespect your mom. And uh, back then, he would whoop my behind, then tell my mom, then she would whoop my behind. And so there was just certain things you just didn't do because you didn't get just one behind. you behind. You got two, maybe three, if the wrong person was in the room. So you, I dread doing anything, anything inappropriate. And, um, so I remember um, in years past, and my uncle had fell on hard times at one time. And he told me, he said, uh, he said, come here, baby girl. That's what he always called me. He said, I need some place to live. And I said, what do you mean you need some place to live? I said, what are you talking about? What, what's wrong? And I said, Sam, you never need a place to live. You have nieces and nephews. And I said, I know any of them would open their door for you. I said, but you can stay at my house. You know, that's not a problem. I said, but we're not going to have none of this, none of that, and the third, because it's just certain things not going to happen. And I said, I hate to put you in a curfew. I said, but, you know, I have to get up and go to work. And we lived together. And mm -hmm. this, he and I lived together. 
And uh, my uncle never forgot that. And uh, I'm take sorry. your time, take your time, take your time. And um, I was working for the city of Philadelphia um, at one point in my life, housing authority. And uh, we uh, had the task of relocating thousands of families um, throughout the city of Philadelphia, basically changing the fabric of the city of Philadelphia, unbeknownst to us that it was just a drop in the bucket of the gentrification that we're presently experiencing in Philadelphia. But nonetheless, uh, we had to move families. So um, I had the task of hiring people to work with the moving companies. I was like, my uncle need a job and this one need a job. So I hired my uncle and um, one day one of the, the moving guys, unbeknownst to them who I was, um, basically his boss, and uh, he said something and one of the guys was like, man, you, that's, that's Lamb's, that was his other nickname, that was his street nickname, so that's Lamb's niece. I said, I don't care who she is. So somebody else said, you better care because she's boss. He said, you better care. So my uncle, I could see his, his chest, he was like so proud. He was so proud of me. But, and I was so proud to be able to help him in a time of need. Right. And so that, I don't know. I can go on and on about that man because he was all that, you know. Cool old dude, cool young guy. And uh, when I, when he was young, when he gave me the job of washing his uh, kangos, he, um, they used to go to the, I think it was called the Penny Arcade and they would, they would take pictures and, and the guys used to get like people, men and women, old and young, used to get dressed up dark and take pictures at the Penny Arcade. And my uncle had the best, his best friend was named Twan. Twan left to go to the military. And uh, he, he uh, came home one night and they all were at the bar and the um, bar was at 16th and Wallace Street, I think. And uh, they were all at the bar and a fight broke out. And Twan, ex I mean, he's military and just a, like my uncle, another cool guy. So him and my uncle broke up. No, Twan broke up the fight. If I can remember the stories correctly. Twan broke up the fight. And then when my uncle came in, uh, they like calmed the whole situation down. He made sure he took him and Twan walked to Twan, walked home together. Twan said, man, I can't go nowhere else. I got to go home. I haven't seen my mom yet. And so my uncle and another friend was in the car. They had just dropped Twan off. Before Twan could put his key in the door, they heard gunshots ring out. And um, I believe this affected my uncle to this day. And the person who Twan just broke the fight up with, broke the fight up, shot and killed Twan. So his mother, he never made it home to his mom. Matter of fact, he did. He collapsed in her arms when she opened the door wow. and died. And, and I, I think that like kind of affected my uncle because that was his yeah, best friend. Yeah, and they were like maybe 25, I'm going to say. I'm, no, early 20s when right. that happened. Yeah, but he was he was a good guy. <laughs> Well, to, today with the, um, yes. I guess the, what, what can I say? The, the circumstances that we have young children in today and the, the type of parenting, what advice would you give parents today for children that have behavioral problems and, you know, you know, that they're out of control and their parents can't really control them. Well, being a parent, good, bad, or indifferent, does not come with a set of instructions. That's right. In some instances, it's sink or swim. As I mentioned, 
I was a teenage mother. And um, back then, oh my God, that was the worst thing I could have done. It, to be a pregnant teenager in the, in the early 70s, it's, oh my God, I was, I was blackballed, I was outcast, I was, I was just, it was the worst thing. So, I mean, God forbid, if, if I was, um, I had mental problems or if I was suicidal, I may have taken my life because of what I went through, but still I rise like dust, still I rise. And I said, I could show you better than I can tell you. I'm not gonna be a statistic. I'm not gonna become, um, just because I'm in it, don't mean I have to be of it. Right. I'm still in it, but I don't have to be of it. And um, these, you, you can't, even in my own family, there is a generation, fifth, I don't know. You can't tell them anything. Even if you want to give advice, they don't want to hear it. Um, like I said, it. Look, the nineteen-year-old boy that just shot up the people in Memphis, Tennessee, the other day. Handsome, beautiful young man, but the black community doesn't want to accept. If they have a if they have a problem, their response is, what you trying to play me? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you. You're trying to, I don't I didn't understand that term. And it was said to me, and I was trying to give advice. And their response was, so what you trying to play me? The tragedy that my family has and is still enduring from the act of five children, even though only two physically hit my uncle, mm -hmm. they were all involved. They right. laughed about it. It was funny. It was TikTok. It was a, a social media event to beat up a senior citizen who's the only crime was to be what he has always been. Well, that, that's not no crime, you know, if you're trying to help out individuals in the community. That's, that's when he was trying to help children in the community at close to 3 o'clock a.m. I, I don't know where they get, I, 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 would, I wouldn't even open a window at 3 o'clock in the morning in my house, unfortunately, because of, of, of the times that we live in. Right. So, he said to them, why y'all kids out here this late? And, and I have evidence of that on video from the phones that the detectives uh, provided to our family. Mm -hmm. He asked them, what y'all kids doing out here this late? The big boy, 14 year old kid who's like six feet mm -hmm. tall and six feet wide. You would never think he was 14. He said, let's expletive this old expletive up. So even though he said it, the female 14 year old took it to a level that all the other five was like, you're, going, you're doing too much. But when her mother, when her mother, the 14 year old who is presently incarcerated, facing the charges, excuse me, as an adult, and the court hearing uh, is uh, this month, next week, um, to her to say on news that um, it was the other kids. It wasn't my daughter. They're the bad ones, point, point, point. My, right. the good one. That's a problem right there, you know. And it's it, you're you're deflecting every question that's coming in. Not my child. Real quick story. My son 
who was is almost 50, a year away from being 50. Mom, stop telling people my age because he doesn't look it. So, you know, <laughs> says um, the eight ball leather jacket. You may remember it. I know some yeah. of you could remember it. It's a little horrible. I never could <laughs> afford one, but I. <laughs> I asked my son, I said, do you want one? He was like, mom, I don't want that corny thing. I said, okay. I mean, it would have been a struggle, but it was the, the end thing. I would have robbed Peter, but I would have gotten it for him because he wasn't a bad kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, get a, I get a call that um, from... Um, the police station at Broad and Champ lost, uh, 35th, 30, I think, 35th, I think. Mm -hmm. I get a call. They said um, that they had my son. He was here incarcerated uh, until I came um, for armed robbery. Like, what? I said, first of all, here it is. Y'all got the wrong child. My son, digress, my son, stay on the choir. My son, he's on the usher board. My son go to church. Not my son, not my child. Remember those words, not my child. I asked my neighbor, I said, can you run me to Broaden Champ Laws? We run the Broaden Champ Laws, I get in. He said, are you all right? I said, I'm fine. I'll take Scepter home if I have to, but I'm fine. I get in there, I'm loud, obnoxious, ratchet, young, horrible. Let, not my child. Y'all got the wrong. He's on the choir. He on the, they told me, they said, Miss Stevens, they said, if you don't be quiet, we're going to arrest you. I got quiet because I didn't want to be. I don't know. <laughs> they bring my son out from in the back with cuffs on. And me being the parent and conspiracy theorist that I was, I don't listen to anyone I want to hear, my son, and then we'll take it from there. And I asked him, I said, did you? His response to me, and I don't believe in sign languages. I want verbalize. I don't. God has allowed me to be able to hear, so I want to hear you. I said, did you rob? No, no, no. I'm sorry. The police officer said that he robbed a kid for his eight ball leather jacket. Oh, the like one you broke. <laughs> you don't rob somebody for it. I said they got to be hit. So this is after the police had told me to calm down. And he said, and this is the fake gun he used. It was a toy. He said, but I want to let you know, if any of my officers saw this and he pointed at them, your son, you would be planning a funeral instead of taking him home. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is before the Trayvon Martin and the right. James and all this craziness against black while living while black. So um, when they brought him out, I asked him, did he? He said, yes. He must. I don't know what my facial expression read. And I said to him, why? And this was his response. He hunched his shoulder. I felt less than one inch tall. Mm. I was so embarrassed and ashamed. And the police officer must have read my body language. And he uh, told me, he said, um, let us finish the paperwork. You can take him home with you. I, oh, said, wow. I didn't open my mouth. We waited for the, it was the C bus then, the Broad Street bus. Right. We waited for the bus, got him on the bus. He was trying to talk to me. I couldn't even talk, words couldn't come out. But when that mother kept saying, not my child, my child's the good one, never say never. Never say what your child won't do. Because even though we put it in them, even though my child is and a successful entrepreneur, he owns his own business. He's a licensed, insured, um, you always tell me to get it right, master electrician. Mm -hmm. So, but he had to get there. But in order to get there, there were obstacles. There were bumps in the road, but never say never. 
and these the parents need to be held accountable because they somebody is has dropped the ball and somebody failed because that could have been a real gun my son had he could right. have shot that kid over a stupid jacket that I said I would have bought him just a week before so it doesn't come being a parent doesn't come with instructions but always know there's help there's someone yeah you you can get the instructions mm -hmm. now real, real quick young people don't want help they don't want help that's true that's very true real quick um since the loss of your uncle how has your family you know been coping within the, within the community well, well mr parker if my um actions have been indicative to right now how our family feels right a lot of us are still in counseling <laughs> a lot of us are not handling it well we um got a call one night my mom is out at three o'clock in the morning and says she's looking for her earrings stressing my, my uncle was killed at three o'clock in the morning so she's right. out doesn't live too far from where the actual thing happened that yeah. so she's out looking for earrings at three o'clock sister ran there and we all ran there so there's um there's some problems there's some hills to climb but as i ask god every day if you don't move the mountain just give me the strength to climb right amen that, that's what i'm asking for our family our community our young people because our young people are our future the right. youth future but our future is looking bleak right now because because you, you need people to, to to show these kids that they are a future i mean it has to be more than a statement that's right you know I mean? like and it you, has more than the village and right I heard them say the young people say i don't want to hear about that martin luther king bs i don't want to hear about that slavery that's that's our culture though that's our history mm -hmm. and you can't one of the is it sankofa it's a it's one of the proverbs african proverbs yeah from, that's a movie it's uh, san san Cooper, sankofa Right. But the girl goes back in the slavery times and experiences right. how it was. Right. Don't because you have to know your past in order to move forward. They have to. And I just wish I could strap them all down and tell them stuff. <laughs> because I'm I'm a I'm a storyteller. And my family had uh, I have nieces that are adults now come to me and say, can you tell me the story uh, of the white Christmas tree? I just make stuff up off the top of my head. And mm -hmm. I never forget one year I had all the kids who are all either in their 30s or late 20s now. And they someone walked past the room and they was like, what channel was that on? Right, <laughs> was, right. Got made up. But the story was so vivid that they thought it was something that I watched from the TV. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm the family's um, story. So. Well, it was definitely a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Mr. Um, we definitely got your back. You know, you. you, I'm definitely, for you, I'm definitely a, a phone call away. Thank you, you know, sir. Anything for you. Thank um, you. Um, uh, I, I thank you again for just coming on you know, sharing out your story, you know, enlightening the community on Mr. James Lambert so he wouldn't be just another, you know, victim to senseless crime. And you and you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. And like I said, it definitely was a pleasure seeing you and hearing from you again. Thank you so much. All right. God bless. Bye bye. Well, um, it was i wanted you guys to see and you know <clears throat> realize that mr lambert was more like i just said 
than just a a victim out on the street. You know, he was somebody's loved one, a uncle, a friend, you know, a, a devoted community member. And he definitely will be missed by his family. Um, the situation of these children today is now dire. And what I mean by that is that, like she just said, excuse me for a moment. One of the children are looking at murder charges as an adult, and she's just 14. Um, that's, that's tragic also. And I don't know the outcome of what's going to happen to her and the young man, but like I tell my kids, you know, you gonna have to face the consequences of your actions. You know, I remember my mom telling me, you know, or if you get locked up one time, I'll get you out. But if you get locked up again, that's on you. And these parents don't even have that mentality. You understand what I'm saying to you? And we want you guys to, to be better at this parenting thing. I know it's a struggle sometimes. I know when you have, um, you know, kids that's out of control and you can't control them, you'd be surprised how many parents tell me or tell people I know that they can't control their children and the child would be like 14, 10, or 12. And it's just a, it's just a horrible feat. You know, even the, the teachers in the schools you know, some of the teachers are emotionally drained and break down in the, you know, after the class is over because they can see the direction of these children. Um, when Ms. Davis died, when we found out she passed away, my daughter was so heartbroken. She said, Dad, you know, <clears throat> she'll never get a chance to see what you know what type of dance i became and i said you know amani just like when you look at kids that's bad and you can kind of you know project their feet miss davis seen the same thing in you you know what i mean and as as parents you know we really have to be more intuitive with these children and don't give up hope now you have these kids from birth and you can shape and mold them in any type of fashion that you want to but because of the inexperience and a lack of skills at parenting sometimes that goes astray so on the 24th of this month, we'll be having an, a parenting forum. And we, we just want you guys to get as much knowledge on parenting as you can. I got some definite seasoned veterans that, you know, definitely have my back or they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't do this for me to help you guys out because we all love these kids. Like Ms. Steven said, our children are the future, but sometimes they just need somebody to look and see, you know, that they are the product of our future and not the product of demise, you know. Um, <clears throat> this, this last summer or two summers ago, some children their only accomplishment was graduating middle school because they died. They never even had a chance to, you know, maybe some of them didn't even have a chance to attend high school, you know, to even graduate. And it's, it's such a shame because 
like Miss Stevens just said, everybody has this image that their child is good. But it depends on what you know the term good is. So if you don't know, I suggest you look it up. And don't go off of your own intellect. Like it's it's a lot of things that I know, you know, just from experience in school. But sometimes you got to take a word just as simple as good and look it up to make sure that you match the definition, that it ain't your own definition of good. Because your definition of good and what good actually is could land somebody six feet under or in somebody's prison. So as always, I love you guys. I definitely, you know, we here for you, Miss Stevens, um, and and everybody. You know, families of victims who lost members senselessly to violence. You know, our foundation is here for you. Um, me, myself, our my family in the seventies. You know, they lost we lost a member senselessly to violence. You know what I mean? I mean, it was an accident, but it was still senseless violence. We, the, the buck has to stop somewhere. And Ms. Stevens was saying, you know, we don't necessarily, this parenting doesn't come with an instruction manual, but that's at first. But there's books out there that you can get. It's tutorials, it's shows. I mean, the Cosby Show, Family Matters, shoot the Brady Bunch. <laughs> Whatever you got to do <laughs> to get this parenting thing right, you better do it. Because your child's state, your child's life is at stake with it. You know what I mean? And please don't the, the school is not school is not the, the reform center, is the education center. These parent these teachers are responsible for turning your kid around and turning good behavior into bad behavior. Their job is to only teach. So you have to play a part in that role too. You got to groom and shape your child into an ideal, you know, to ideal citizen so they know how to properly behave, you know, outside the house and inside the house, too. You know, they talking to you all crazy. Guess what? They talking to somebody else all crazy, too. You know what I mean? So I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Again, we want to thank Miss Stevens. And our hearts definitely go out to you and your family. And as always, you guys have a wonderful night. God bless and good night.